Hello, everyone. As you're joining, um, you will see that we're all here. We're ready to go. We're just going to give everyone about three minutes to be able to be in the room, and then we will start. So at about 1.33 Eastern time on the 33, wherever you are. <laughs> All right, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Welcome to the 1.30 Eastern time in the United States uh, time slot for QuidCon. We are back from our lunch break and this is Find Your Sweet Spot, Better Gameplay Strategies for Every Team, um, featuring some fantastic coaches from all kinds of different teams and organizations that we will be meeting in just a moment. Um, the program description, is every team has different strategies they bring on the field. Review different full field strategies and learn how to choose the right gameplay strategy for your team. So um, without any further chatting from me, let's meet everyone who is here. We have Azim Hussein. Hi Azim. Jamie Luby. Kieran Collier. And Stefan who did not tell me how to pronounce his last name when we were talking about it before, but he can do that in just a moment um, to make sure that we don't mess that up. So um, I'm going to let each of them have an opportunity to introduce themselves to you. And uh, during this kind of introductory session here about your background, I'd like for you each to answer which teams and positions you've coached for how long and what was the biggest uh, reason that brought you into coaching. And so we will start with uh, Kieran and go right ahead. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, so I, I began coaching my junior year in college uh, at Emerson College's uh, intramural program. We had six uh, house league teams, and I stepped up to kind of coach my last two years for that. Uh, and then in fall 2017, a year after I had graduated, I coached Emerson College Quidditch and have been doing that for the past four years, uh, as you can tell from my ill-fitting polo. Um, and the biggest force that brought me into coaching uh, was pretty much just perceived gaps, whether in, in leadership or, or knowledge or, or culture. Um, 
I feel like every time I've stepped up, it's because I felt like I could positively contribute and make things better than they were. Yes, you also brought that Emerson program back to a, a very strong program, which is appreciated by all of us up here. Uh, Stefan, could you could you uh, let us know who you are and all of the questions that are on the screen? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, my last name is Wilsching, but since I'm from Germany, I think nobody can actually pronounce it correctly. So <laughs> that's why I didn't tell before. But yeah, maybe that's your task for at home, pronounce Wilsching. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anyhow, um, I have been the head coach for Darmstadt Athenas. That's my home team here in Germany. Um, and I have been doing this for four years now. And I have also had one year where I was uh, head coach for Team Germany, the national team. Um, and I think the biggest force that actually brought me into coaching was because at the end of 2016, there was just no coach in our hometown. And so someone asked me if, if I'm going to try it. And so I said, okay, yes, sure. It's better than having nobody. And yeah, it's actually a good a decision that I, I really liked and I'm very happy that I did it. I did not mean to move us on to the next screen there. Um, I, if um, Azim, you could go next. Sure, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Azim. Uh, I've been with Quidditch since National 6. Uh, I started off at UTSA playing there, University of Texas San Antonio. Uh, it turned into me coaching the last couple of years just because we also didn't have a coach and we, we realized the value of having somebody who wasn't playing in like deep bracket games, uh, running lines, like doing all the other things that you need. Uh, from there, I went to Cavalry for three years. Uh, I spent three summers with the Outlaws as well, either assistant coaching or head coaching. Uh, I was with the Lost Boys Quidditch Club last year when I moved out to the West Coast. And then I am head coaching the U.S. National Team's Development Academy this year. Um, yeah. Jamie? Hey. Um, so I have coached two teams before. Uh, one as an assistant coach, which is Lost Boys. Currently, uh, I'm the assistant coach for Lost Boys with Azim. And uh, I have also coached UC Irvine's and Teeter Quidditch team. I coached each of those teams for one season. And I would say the biggest force that brought me into coaching UCI would have been just the desire to continue playing the sport. After I graduated UCLA, I wanted to keep involved. And then I moved back close to home and the only college that was nearby that seemed like a solid place to start a team was UC Irvine. And so founding that team kind of led into me becoming the coach for the team. Um, and then with Lost Boys, it was just being someone with more experience. I, um, I, I wanted to get involved in a leadership role and that just kind of led me into the coaching role as well. So, so. Thank you very much. We are very excited to have all of you here with all of your different perspectives. And so let's get into some of the specifics. So we'll have um, three basic uh, large categories that the questions are divided into. One is pre-tournament preparation. Second is in-game strategies. And then third is interpersonal dynamics. Um, feel free to uh, go more in depth into any of those things as I bring them up. Uh, I just wanted to give you the format and framework to start off and have you as the experts take it where you need to go. So um, for pre-tournament preparation, what if any health and fitness strategies do you develop for your team and how well have those been able to be implemented? Uh, Jamie, you go ahead and go first. Okay. Um, yeah, Azim and I will probably say something similar on this, but the Snapchat group has been really, really great for our team. Uh, we have a group on Snapchat where we just, every time one of us does something physical, we like we send it over to the Snapchat and share that with the team. Uh, during the actual season, we were keeping track of who was contributing to the Snapchat group. And that was something that we you know, if we, I'll let Azim, Azim go further into this, but sometimes that would uh, 
determine, or at least it was in place to help us determine, you know, if we have two people who are both competitive and both worthy of that last roster spot, who do we pick? We pick the one who's been more active on the Snapchat group, showing us that they've been engaged. So I would say that's one strategy that we've used. Um, yeah. Azim, follow up? Uh, yeah, I think it was a good way to, uh, that, that stemmed from my time back at Cavalry as well. So sometimes people couldn't come all the way to practices. So it was a good way to show that even though you weren't always at a practice, you're still staying active or staying fit. And it's just a good tool to use to motivate uh, your other teammates. Uh, I know me personally, there have been plenty of days where I felt like a slob, and I, like didn't want to do anything. And I opened my Snapchat and it was like 10 people doing things. And I was like, okay, all right, team culture, like let's do this. Uh, and it, it works. Uh, it does a great job doing that. Uh, moving into more pre-tournament oriented prep, uh, I definitely think it's important to learn to taper off workouts um, the week, week and a half before. You know, you're not lifting heavy, you're eating right, you're taking care of your body. Um, those are like the big ones for sure. Is there anything that you do specifically like day of the tournament to make sure that everyone is healthy and ready to uh, play a one or two days out there? Yeah, don't eat a waffle for breakfast before a tournament. Um, please don't do that. Uh, yeah, no, just, you know, eating right, making sure you're up early, uh, getting some good dynamic stretches in. Uh, if you have physical therapy drills, do physical therapy drills. Um, but pretty much it's like, listen to your body the morning of, like do what you need to do. Don't feel the need to rush, get a good like pre-tournament poop in. Cause I know that like holds a lot of people back as well. Um, and it's just like getting in the right mindset as well. Um, and I guess that's more like mental as opposed to like a fitness strategy. Um, but I think those are just like having a good routine. And I think like everybody you talk to, um, who have been like doing a lot of nationals, they, they just have like a set routine that they just kind of go through for the day. Um, whether it's sleeping literally like two hours and just like getting ready to go. Um, so just like eating a good breakfast. Yeah, just like everything I'd mentioned. Kieran? Yeah, I think as, as a college coach, I, I have to kind of just understand that there's a lot out of my control in terms of uh, health and, and fitness decisions made by the, the players I coach. Um, but I think what Azim and, and Jamie have said about creating a culture that encourages workouts and, and sharing of you know, fitness accomplishments uh, is huge and in incentivizing people to want to take those extra steps. And I think on tournament days, my biggest concern is just making sure everyone's awake and like on the train towards the tournament. Um, but hydration, the, the week leading up to, to nationals and regionals tends to be a big emphasis as well, just because especially college students tend to not drink a lot of water. But I know that's kind of throughout the entire quid community and not just college. Um, particularly in that light, do you have anything that gets your like very new players, particularly ones that are just starting out um, to, to start down the road to fitness to be able to uh, be ready for the team later. Yeah, I think, you know, some of it, Azim mentioned tapering, but I think not only do you have to kind of taper off as you get to the tournament, you have to build up slowly and really scaffold the learning. And I think when you break anything large down into smaller chunks, it makes it kind of um, more um, doable for, for newer players. Um, so I think that's really big. We also, you know, um, try and do different like workout challenges as well. So we've, you know, done like push up and, and tricep dip challenges. We, we post like running workouts and just try and kind of throw things at the wall and see what sticks because everyone's a different athlete and people will latch onto different things. Some of them will really fall in love with running. Some of them will get really into doing sit-ups. You know, it's really a personal choice. Uh, we'll get to you in just a moment, Stefan. Jamie has her hand up. Jamie? Thanks. Yeah. Just to build off of what Kieran was saying in terms of that slow build of making sure that you're doing what you need to do and getting your team involved and, and getting your team excited about working out before you get to those big tournaments. Um, something we did on Anteaters was uh, we actually had a specific practice that was devoted only to conditioning. And we did a conditioning practice once a week and it was optional. It was not something that was required for everybody, but it was a really fun environment where people would just come and we work out together. Uh, I think it was like an hour or two hours long um, and we would just condition together. And it was not only a really healthy way to get ourselves prepped for tournaments, but it also, um, it was fun. Like we just had a really good time and we, we would go to practices and people would talk about how much fun the conditioning practice was. And then that would make other people want to come. 
And Stefan, is there anything unique or different about this that you do to get people prepped in Germany? Well, I think for the tournament prep, it's kind of uh, the same thing, but I can actually share something that we are currently doing right now during COVID. Um, because in Germany, we just had a virtual tournament that's only about conditioning. You get points for running, you get points for going with your bike, and you get points for doing workouts like YouTube workout or Zoom workout or team workout, whatever workout you want to do. And uh, with those points, you you um, can put them on a website and then you play against a different team in Germany. And uh, now we are actually at the half finals and we are probably losing right now, but that's okay. <laughs> we made it here. That um, It was actually 32 teams that participated in this last eight weeks. And I think we ran like all around the world. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, something I would share from Germany right now. So um, this question is, how much do you get your team together for practice and strategic development? Um, not only just how much do you practice, but like what are some specific things that you make sure you include in practice sessions to um, get the most out of your team again before something is about to happen? Um, we'll go uh, with Azim to start this time. Um, so it really depends. Uh, I know normally, at least for college teams, I remember we'd practice about two times a week, uh, sometimes three. Um, for club teams, it was once a week just because everybody is scattered. And then we would do like a skills practice in the middle of the week. So you could work on like individual skills, whether it's shooting, whether it was like tackling form and technique. Uh, and then like in practices, when it comes to like actually implementing and, and figuring out different strategies to use, it just comes down to how much you and like the rest of the, the captains or the coaches uh, want to allocate to what you're doing, whether it's legitimately just like snitch on pitch beater stuff, then like the beater pairings can go off and do their own thing. Um, when it's like a more intense, like this is a full team strategy, uh, it definitely like you just slow everything down and it breaks down to walking through it all. And I mean, I, I know we would never do something like leading up like the week or a week and a half before the tournament, unless it was like extremely necessary. Uh, I think it also comes down to how well you're able to scout ahead of time uh, and then give your team a month, five weeks, six weeks to build a strategy and, and walk through it, make mistakes and learn from it. Um, so I think it, it really does vary based off of like what your timeline is, what you as a team are looking for. Uh, whether it's like perfecting your own strategy, whether it's like, oh, you know, you're going to play a specific team, like how do you approach what you're looking at? Um, so, so it definitely varies, but I, I think at least a once a week practice with like a skill session is a great way to get started um, just to work on like, like the macro versus the micro of Quidditch strategy. Stefan. Um, I think it's actually part of every practice that we have um, to go over a strategy. Um, but like if our practice is two hours long, then we take maybe 10 minutes for this. Um, but yeah, that's how we do it, I think. So um, one of the big things that's come up in kind of building new Quidditch strategies, especially in the last like five years, as more and more film has been, um, available for people is use of film both in team sessions and in kind of the overall prep for how you're going to develop your own um, strate strategic development for how you will take on other teams. So um, Jamie, how do you use film and how has that changed over the course of time that you've been a part of Quidditch? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'll be upfront in saying that I definitely used film more often when I was on Anteaters as kind of the head coach there. Um, Azim, I would say you probably did a little bit more with film than I did last season. Um, but when I was really involved in like the, I, I, when I was really involved in the whole breaking down the strategy of the different teams that we were playing against, um, it was mostly uh, like I, I had a, a system of I would watch the film first and I would take notes on the strengths that the other team has. I would watch the film a second time and I would 
you know, pausing and taking notes to see what their holes might be, what their weaknesses might be. And then after watching, I'm taking a third set of notes to determine like which players on my team have the toolkit to exploit those weaknesses and which overall team strategies and strengths we have that we could either build upon from things that we're already using um, or even learn anew to exploit the weaknesses that we see in the film. Um, this season or last season as an assistant coach, I was more focused on like interpersonal relationships with people and building skills. Um, but yeah, so when I was on Anteaters, that's kind of, that was my process. And since, uh, Jamie kind of led it straight into you, Azim, how did you use film this last year with Lost Boys? Um, so to preface it, I would say Cole Travis from Texas Cavalry is like the goat of watching film, like hands down the greatest of all time. Um, I just kind of like stole the system that we use. And by that, I mean, I learned it and it was very legal and everything. Um, but it just comes down to profiling the team with film. And it's really important to find the key players, you know, find what their um, tendencies are, what their weaknesses are. They like to tunnel in, like just dive first in regardless of beater conditions, especially when they're transitioning, like film will show that how their beaters like to play, whether it's very aggressive at mid pitch or sitting on the hoops and being more docile, like film will show that everything's just in the film. Um, definitely, especially like bigger tournaments, we're able to kind of file out, like profile out the entire like tournament docket and like see who's coming. And then we look at, all right, like high ranking players or like people that are well known, like, why are they so good? Like, what are their weaknesses? What do their teams like to do overall? Like, where do they really find that dip that you can take advantage of? Um, so really when it comes down to like gameplay strategies, it, it gives you a good opportunity to see the team before you have to actually interact with them. And then just being sure that once you do find their weaknesses or you figure out like what strategy you wanna implement, it, it comes down to practicing that as well at practices. So I remember for us at Lost Boys, as well as like Cavalry, as well as Outlaws, like for all of those, it would be like, okay, let's try these different variations of lines at practices and see how they fit together. And we think this will be a good way to stop X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think it's also like, just as important to come up with an idea on how to stop it and practice it, as opposed to just like watching film, like, oh, look out for this. And like, that's it, right? Like be proactive with it. Yeah, I think there, there's kind of like two ways you can use film to plan for like gameplay strategies. And the first is, is what, you know, Jamie and Azim have been talking about with, with scouting and preparing for your opponent. And, and in that realm, you know, I typically kind of look and try and figure out like what is the team's number one option or number one, like their, their A play essentially. And usually um, with the amount of prep time we have, especially with, you know, sometimes we're playing games every two weeks. Um, so we don't have a lot of practice time. So find one actionable thing that the team can take away that you can stress in a huddle, um, especially for like younger players who don't know the intricacies of put a strategy yet. I found that's a very manageable way of, you know, they're mainly going to go for a drive and dish. So our main job is to take that away, force them to beat us on the wings or something like that. But the, the other way to use film, I feel like, is to create or enforce your own team concepts. And, and that's something that I use film a lot for personally. I know I love to watch RPI game film specifically, because I think they're a really well coached team, but um, you watch other teams and see kind of what they do effectively and then see if the strengths their team has transfer to yours. So like RPI will do a lot of having three ball handlers who screen for each other and they pass and screen away and then they overload one side and then pass across to the unmarked chaser by the hoops afterwards. And that doesn't necessarily work for Emerson because it requires to have three strong ball handlers all screening for each other. But RPI also, and I'm sorry, Mario, if you're watching this, because I'm just talking all about things I've stolen from RPI, but they also, uh, a year or two ago, were doing this double drag screen where they'd start the ball on one wing, screen twice for the person to run to the opposite wing, and then have the chaser behind hoops pop out. And so you get the defense all committing to one side and then quickly swing the ball over. And that only required one ball handler and two screeners. And so that was much more feasible for the current Emerson team I was coaching to kind of steal and cherry pick. And then we kind of worked on that play ourselves and it helped us create an identity that year. And I feel like I really use film as like teaching examples of being able to show um, my team, like this is um, a team that's really effectively running a zone defense. Let's look at what they're doing and whatnot and use it as teaching moments. Um, 
when you have the opportunity to. That's great. Uh, Stefan, um, how do you use film and what is the state of film in German Quidditch? Um, actually, I don't think I have anything to add to, to my previous talkers. Um, but maybe in film in Germany is also kind of developing at the moment, but um, it's not that we, we don't have so many resources as you guys have. Like you have archives of, of film, we don't have that. Yes, <laughs> I, I, that's, that's, that's sort of what I was that. wondering is, um, I feel like you're more in the state we were maybe four years ago as far as what the film is. And so, yeah, yeah. great. We'll move on to the next one, but you can, uh, you can answer this one. So in order to make sure that you have the most effective use of all your players, how is it that you go about dividing up the responsibilities of your head coaches and this can transition into actually how you use them on game to implement your strategies as well. Uh, you go, yeah. first, since you didn't get to talk about the last one. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, actually in practice, we usually have a, have a coaches divided by position, like you have a beta coach and a uh, chaser coach. Um, and that also, also works for tournaments a little bit, but what we, um, what we have found to be useful is to have a, one-on-one -on -one coach um, who is only responsible for giving feedback to just exactly one person. Um, and this is something that we can actually take, take a lot of value from because um, that way we can develop our players like um, directly. And it's, it, it helps, especially for new players, but it also helps uh, for, for every player because there's something, something that every player can actually improve on. Um, yeah, and then a third position that we usually try to fill is a subbing coach, because um, I, I actually don't know if you have heard about this, but in Germany we have the, we have changed the gender rule to be to be a maximum of three until the snitch comes. Um, so this is a Germany only rule. So we have to play three by uh, three three, um, and so subbing is a lot more complicated sometimes, and that's when it's good to have a person who is responsible for that. Um, yeah, this actually doesn't have to be a coach. It can, can also be a, a player of your team, but it's really important to have someone watching out for this. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so we're going to move on to the actual in-game strategies now. And I feel like this is um, something that Kieran was just talking about when you were talking about how you um, implemented your strategies using kind of the RPI techniques and then changed them for Emerson, is there anything to this that you'd like to add about how you did, how you come up with a strategy that is going to be your overall look for your team and then how you teach it to your team? Yeah, I think you know some of it kind of depends on what the the current meta of the game you're playing is and kind of what a lot of the teams around you are doing. Um, you know, it used to be a very drive and dish heavy meta in the Northeast, and now it's a lot more passing on the wings. And so being able to adjust to that and so make sure one, your defense is prepared for it, but also the meta's changed for a reason and taking advantage of the uh, inefficiencies that have been found. Um, I think really, though, it just comes to figuring out player strengths, um, which is tough in, in the Northeast in any region that has a fall regional because you have maybe two months to figure out who's on your team and how to use them effectively before the second biggest tournament of the year. So that's always a struggle, but I think keeping it really simple is big. So, you know, maybe you have one kind of offensive concept that you drill when you're going against the matching defense uh, where players are marking up directly and one going against the zone. And so you just kind of have two things you work with and you don't have to overwhelm the players with a lot of specific plays um, talk more like open concepts and then trust, that you'll put players in positions to succeed. And then I think in terms of teaching those strategies, it's just a lot of scaffolding, like I said before. So you really start small and build it. And so if you're working with players who have no experience with the game, talk about spacing, talk about you know, different responsibilities, depending on where you're on the field and then build off of that. Um, and then finally, I think just using as many mediums as you can to convey the information. So Azim talked about, you know, first you want to like talk through a strategy and then walk through it at a practice. Then like, you know, you add defenders, you ramp up the game speed, 
but also making sure you have like, you know, film review if you're able to make PowerPoints that you can share with the team for them to look at when practices aren't happening and if they want to do a little extra studying, draw on whiteboards if you if you have the ability. But like everyone learns differently. So really just trying to throw as many things at the wall and see what different players gravitate towards. And then that can inform your decisions later on in the season. Azim, I feel like, especially being in the West and also having a club team at this point, um, what is different about how you can kind of implement your strategy? And are you able to do it over the course of multiple years? Um, you can you can answer that however you feel. Yeah, so I think the I think Karen hit the nail on the head when it comes to addressing college students, especially when it comes to not having that experience of strategy. Uh, and I know with the club, you'll see players who this is their first time ever playing. They're at a club level. It, it's ramped up a lot higher. Um, but for the most part, I think it's a lot easier when everybody's able to kind of like buy in and understand the system uh, and how like base strategy works. It makes it a lot quicker to learn and implement. Um, I know most of the things that we look for um, spanning from Southwest and West has been the same, right? Like my favorite things to look at are how defense shifts, where they're defensively playing chasers and beaters as well and kind of taking advantage of that. Um, and really like some of the smaller things, um, whenever there's a weaker line that comes in, you can kind of tell that off of the film, just the way the flow of the game ends up going. Um, and then understanding like positioning for transitions are also big. Uh, if you know that your team or like the enemy team, the opponent likes to make a lot of like uh, contact that mid pitch and look for those transitions and look for those turnovers or fast breaks. You understand how, how to slow the game down. And these are all things that come with time and experience. Um, but even in the club scene, I feel like there, there are mistakes that happen the entire season, right? Like, I think there's no perfect strategy, like period ever. And I think even implementing it, like you want to hit your stride when it hits like nationals time. But I think the entire year is just great. And the entire season is great to experiment with and to make mistakes with. And I think a lot of people forget that, um, like as nice as winning is, like as nice as winning multiple tournaments is or, or winning games, there's only one that really matters at the end of the day. And I think using every opportunity at every tournament, every game to like adjust your strategy or try something new uh, or just be constructive and build off of what you've done is way more important than like just cramming a strategy in last second and like getting pissed that it's not working um, so I think it's also the approach when it comes to both club and college players is how do you approach failing at your strategy? Um, I think especially when it comes to club, when you only have what, like 32 teams at nationals as well, right? Like it's, it's much smaller or 36. I, I don't even remember the number, but it's it just, you get less looks, um, which, which makes it harder for sure. But I think just utilizing the entire year, big, big, big play. So Jamie, um, I think that I, from watching you play, I think of you as like a tactician out on the field. Um, Thank you. Like the way that you, the way that you take the strategy and can implement it. So do you have any specific tips about how you've gone about doing that? Like taking that big picture and breaking it down for an individual? Definitely. Um, thank you. Uh, so I always start by, so I'm a, I'm mostly, I would say a beater coach this season or last season. I, I would say that I always start by examining two things, defensive beating, and then also what are the transitions between offense and uh, defense and offense. So how does a team take their beaters and go from, okay, we've just stopped a goal on our side how do we transition into offense? And so once you know how another team is going to react in those moments, then I think you can really start to pick apart what you should be doing in response. And there are multiple different beater strategies. I mean, you can do isolations. You can run things like uh, blindside beats. You can um, take a really aggressive offensive approach. You can take a very uh, like conservative offensive approach. Um, and I think it comes down to what is the other team's defensive beating like? And so anytime I'm trying to coach my beaters, uh, it's always about uh, building a toolkit that can be used against multiple different types of defenses so that when we get to a point where we say, okay, this team is using, uh, their beaters are sitting back on the hoops. What are we going to do? Okay, let's go ahead and try to, um, push them all the way back at the hoops and then 
give the ball to a really strong ball carrier and make sure that we have a good passing game in that moment. We're supporting our chasers however we need to. So it's that's where I start is look at the defensive beating and see where it goes from there. Stefan, um, what is the meta strategy that you kind of most deal with in Germany at this point? And how do you uh, implement the, the, strat the strategies and tactics to deal with it for your team? Um, actually, there, uh, as you know, like uh, Germany is still developing lots of strategies. Like every other year we have a, have a new whole set of strategies and every team is trying to adopt those. And actually, I have been one of those people who have actually invented lots of these strategies for Germany. Like, you probably know those strategies. It's nothing new for you. But um, for us, it was like the, uh, the thing that made us win tournaments because we had a strategy and our opponents did not. And then we had a different strategy and our opponents just had no chance to, to know what um what this strategy might be um also because we don't have film obviously um but anyways um what i have learned in my in my years as a coach is if you bring us bring a new strategy to your team um then it's always going to fail at first and so i use a tat principle tat try it adapt it and then try it again and that's how I try to teach um, teach the ideas that are in my head and try to see how they work on the field. And one really important thing when you do this is don't try to pretend that you know everything. Most of the time, you don't know anything. And your team will actually teach you as a coach what works and what does not work. And that's how I felt that in coaching, we can actually invent new strategies and be successful with them. But it obviously does not work if you think that you're the best and you have all the ideas. It only works if you work with your team. Uh, so the questions that are up on the screen now, um, everyone can just kind of weigh in. The idea behind what I'm getting at asking here is, how do you go about making adjustments during a game to what you had planned beforehand and making changes based on what you see out there on the field and making sure that you're making sure that your players of all positions are able to make those adjustments in the game so anyone who would like to take on that type of idea please raise your hand on the thing jamie um, I'm going to keep it short. I'll just basically say that I think uh, it's important to look at, uh, it's important to have flexibility, but uh, most of the time you're going to stick with your base strategy in game. Um, and hopefully you can be flexible with that strategy. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say on it. Azim, you take off from there. Um, yeah, I I would probably just once again build off of like the importance of the tournament, the importance of the game, like playing the first tournament of the year, the second tournament of the year versus uh, like an Elite Eight game at Nationals definitely has an influence on what strategy is being used. Um, on top of that, I think it, it's just as important to give other players an opportunity to learn and grow uh, from their potential mistakes. Uh, I think everybody needs that opportunity to understand, right? Like practices and whatever you implement at practice is going to be vastly different when you're playing in a game in front of a bunch of other people or against the actual team that you're training for. And the only way for them to build their confidence and, and their way to like understand that, yeah, I can play Quidditch at a high level is being given those opportunities to stay in, even if they're down three or four zero, right? Just not like completely scrapping it immediately. Um, I also do think when it comes to like changing game time decisions or like changing strategy in the middle of the game, uh, the best approach for that would be like quick one on one talks on the sidelines. Um, I love the timeouts for MLQ. That was super helpful. Um, 
because one, you're able to stop momentum like you would see in other sports, basketball, football, things like that. But that gives your team an opportunity to come together for a minute and hit the hard reset and figure out what the next steps are and the next plays are. But I think in the middle of a game, when you don't have any timeouts, when you don't have any opportunities, like you find the hole where the leak is, you plug it, whether it's a quick talk with your next defender or somebody who's going to like spark the offense, like, and you just set goals and you set expectations really quickly. Like, Hey, we're stopping this next player. We need a score. We need a quick transition bucket. And then using your sidelines to capitalize and build off of and like push this positive momentum onto the field. Um, I think sidelines are super underrated in that sense. But when you're actually playing, like you can tell the difference versus when your teammates are like dead quiet and when they're hyping you up or they're communicating to you where the other defender is or where the third ball is, like the third bludger is. Um, so I think, especially when it comes to like, you'll, you'll see a lot of teams and newer teams and even college teams and, and rightfully so because they don't like losing just sucks. But I think sticking through some strategy and giving your, your players a chance to grow when things are hard or things are tough um, is big. And I know like we would practice being down minus four, minus five snitches about to be released in practice and then seeing it implemented into games and then turning it around just like we practice. So I think um, giving having faith in your teammates and also giving them an opportunity to, to build off of it would be big. Stefan? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to agree with with my previous speakers. Um, but what I think is uh, you should never do a strategy that you have not practiced before. Um, like if you have two base strategies that were great, then you can obviously interchange them um, depending on your opponent. But if you have like one uh, strategy that is uh, your only one, then you shouldn't change it because I think that's going to fail. Uh, Kieran, you can answer that, and then we're going to move on to this next section. Yeah, I think for me, too, something I always ask myself if I'm making a change in the middle of a game, is it because of the results or the execution? Because I think, you know, when evaluating how your team is performing, it's, is, are they, your principles being executed, and are they being executed with effort? And if the answer is no to one of those first two, it's probably a change that will come not from a, a timeout and from a gameplay switch, but rather from talking to your team and readjusting. But if you're executing well and efforts being put into that execution and it's still not working, that's usually the signal for me that it's time to talk about a larger strategy shift. Azim, did you want to add something before we moved on? I think Kieran makes wonderful points. Oh, great. He does make wonderful points, as does Jamie and you and Stefan. Um, we're going to move on to interpersonal dynamics section. Um, each player has different strengths and weaknesses that they bring to the team. How do you make sure that you're utilizing each player to the best of their ability? Jamie, you mentioned this being kind of your area earlier, if you could take us there first. Yeah, I love working with individuals. Um, this is my thing. This is how I think I've probably been most useful on Lost Boys. And it's, it's really just know your players, know who they are, know what their strengths are, know what motivates them. Like that is the biggest key. You have some players who completely shut down when they're, they're um, you know, uh, when you have to give them a task that is a little bit over their heads. Some players light up when you do that. Uh, it, it's about knowing who the individual is and what they uh, what they have in their toolkit first, uh, so you can build on that. And I think that this really starts by watching your players play in scrimmages, play in drills, and just stepping to the sidelines and watching each individual differently. Like I might take one full practice to watch four players and that's it. And that's my focus for that practice. And in that practice, I'm trying to see, okay, what is, um, what is Luce doing with her hands when she's trying to catch the ball? Um, and what is Cornelia doing when she's trying to score on offense uh, at the middle hoop or at the far hoop? Um, and if you can really break down what each of the individuals are doing and how they're doing it, I, I really think that that's where it all starts. From there, um, it's about having those conversations with them going up to the, hey, I noticed you did this with the ball in this moment. Um, next time, can I have you try this? And then when they try that, 
can I have you come talk to me and, and tell me how it worked? What went well? What didn't go well? How can you improve upon that? And it's just kind of that step-by-step motion individually. Karen, you have all of that and then also have that your players are still college players at this point. Um, so how would you, how do you go about doing that and what additional steps do you have to take to manage those like college-based conflicts that come up? Yeah, well, I, I think they're, they're college students and also specifically, you know, at, at Emerson, it's a lot of college students who haven't played athletics or like sports growing up. Um, so I think for me, my biggest thing is just instilling confidence because oftentimes you can't find out a player's strengths immediately because they don't know what they are. And it's only through empowering the players you have on your team to make mistakes and that making mistakes is okay, that they feel comfortable trying new things and then begin to develop. And once they develop, you can pretty much do everything Jamie said, because Jamie articulated that really well. But for me, it's always just making sure that my players know that they can make mistakes and that I, I want them to, because that's the best way for them to grow. And I want to make sure that we give our attendees a chance to ask questions. I see that we have one in the Q&A now. If anyone else has questions to add, we have a few minutes to take them. The, um, everyone who's here will be able to get into this Slack and ask questions there. We'll post the questions you ask here and all of these things that we haven't had time to get to because this is far too complicated of a subject for one 45 minute little session to, to go over. Uh, but I see that we have a couple of questions. So I'm gonna ask those and then I'll ask the one that's on the screen last. So we have, how do you identify and teach sound fundamentals for players? Uh, Stefan, it's been a while, you go first. Okay. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Sorry. Yes, it is. How do you identify and teach sound fundamentals for your players? What is sound fun? Uh, okay, I get it. Um, good, like well, good fundamentals. Like how do you teach them to do the fundamentals of the game well? Um, yeah, okay, I, I see. Um, that's actually part of our practice. Um, like every week practice, we we, um, we we just have a have it in our practice every every Tuesday, and we we go over the basic drills, and then it's an it's an individual thing because uh, we have so many different backgrounds from like sports backgrounds and they need to uh, like everybody needs a different thing they they need to look at yeah sorry that's kind of a stupid answer but i don't know actually what to say <laughs> uh, azim do you have any uh, tips for teaching fundamentals um i think taking time outside of practice is really big uh when it comes to skill sessions uh it's huge uh especially when you can kind of just work one-on-one -on -one with a person uh, I know it's different, and I'm sure Kieran has way more experience when it comes to like a college student who hasn't played sports in a while or ever, first time playing Quidditch, and like how do you run with the broom between your legs, right? Like it, it's completely different, and I know it's based off a of person, based off of experience, but I think if you're able to slow it down even further, and literally do things such as we're gonna run with the broom between our or PVC pipe between our legs when it comes to like where to position the ball to throw it for like quick scores around the hoops, like I think really small like two on two skill sessions are great because you can just focus on hitting the ball at the same spot over and over again. So I think it's really just taking some time outside of a big grand scale practice to slow it down with the person that really needs work. Um, when it comes to implementing it for like a full team, I'm sure Kieran has way more experience and knowledge currently for that. Yeah, so we'll uh, kind of tie those together in, in two of the other questions, which are addressed specifically to Kieran. Um, if the people you're coaching don't have an athletic background, do you focus on fitness as well as basic skills? And then how do you teach field vision to those players who haven't? So that's kind of taking off on what Azim was saying. Um, you can answer it however you feel fit. Yeah, to continue off of Azim's point first, I also think, you know, empowering uh, returning players is really huge because there's only so much you specifically can do. So getting your, your juniors and your seniors to take the skills they've learned and teach them. Like we had someone who had a really strong baseball background on our team. And so he led throwing drills to help everyone kind of develop their throwing form because that was something that he was really knowledgeable about. And it was a way to give him leadership opportunities and also to you know, raise the fundamental level of our team. Um, I think in terms of fitness level, 
Um, honestly, I just kind of like let the practices take the wind out of people. And I think that kind of motivates uh, people themselves in realizing that they're, they're out of breath at the end of a practice or even earlier. And again, just creating a strong team culture that encourages fitness, um, like we've talked about. And then for, for field vision, I think just putting people in different uh, positions. I, I really preach adaptability uh, and failure as like my two core tenants. And so having people hold the ball in all different parts of the field, getting everyone reps as ball handlers, everyone reps off ball and just getting them comfortable. Um, and it's a slow process and, and people grow at different rates and, and not all learning is linear. So you kind of just have to, you know, uh, embrace the failure part of that process because I think people can get really easily discouraged. Um, but if you kind of single in on failure as an opportunity to grow and not an opportunity to dwell on, I think you'll, you'll see people will, will keep coming back and then learn from their mistakes and, and get better, create this positive feedback cycle. Stefan? Yeah, I, I actually have a good drill for field vision teaching. Um, it's play, play a standard game and then blow your whistle at some random time and everybody has to shut their eyes. And then you ask people some questions like, who is your ne uh, where is your next beater? Or do you have blood control? Or whatever question you, you want to, uh, comes to your mind, they all work. And this is how you can teach field vision really easy and actually in a fun way as well, I think. And then Jamie, if you can answer this one and then we'll move to the last question, then we've got to get out of here. Uh, just how do you support a player who's decided that they're inadequate? Um, and along with that, what do you do to get players to be more confident? Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I do is I have a conversation with them about why they feel that they're inadequate. Uh, if, if they are communicating that they feel inadequate, then I'll have that conversation with them. If I'm noticing things about their mood as they're playing where, um, you know, maybe they're not saying, oh, I feel inadequate. I feel so bad when I try to play this sport. Um, if they're not saying that, then in those moments, I try to mention like, hey, I noticed that when you, you know, didn't catch the ball at this point in time, you seemed a little frustrated. Can we talk about it? And building that converse or starting with that conversation is a good place to build off of. And then from there, um, I would say that building the confidence just comes with practice and repetition. Like most of the time with those, with those players who are struggling with something, it's because they're upset at themselves because they don't have the, the skill set that they want to have. And from there, it, it's just, okay, well, let's practice catching the ball 10 times. Every time you drop it, we're going to do another three. Um, and we're going to continue going until you get it, until you get it. And usually I see people, um, start to improve and then they get really excited. They get really happy about, oh my God, hey, did you see I caught the ball? Like I, I did a good job here. I did a good job there. And um, once they start to feel that confidence, usually it's a snowball effect where it, it starts to improve. So it's that spark of like helping them find that confidence with little small tasks in the beginning of their difficulty. So if um, each of you could, we can't, we have no more time for questions, but the questions will be in the Slack. Thank you all so much for being here. If you could just, um, each of you give us the one line, which is your best piece of advice for a person who is coming to coaches, uh, into coaching, just uh, like 10 seconds each. Uh, Kieran. Yeah, I think just really stressing to your, your team that they probably play better, happier, right? And oftentimes we can focus on the gameplay and strategic, but really, you know, remind your team to breathe, to drink water, to smile and remind them that quit is just something to be enjoyed and you'll see the results uh, translate to success, I think. Azim? Uh, stay constructive, have a growth mindset. Um, don't be a dick to refs. Don't be a dick to refs. Don't be a dick to refs. Stefan? I'm going to cite the national uh, head coach from Australia, uh, take it until you make it. And Jamie, take us home. Yeah. Um, know your players, know who they are, know what motivates them, and have a good mindset that infects the rest of your team. Thank you, everyone. And we are out of here.